Oh, and a pleasant good afternoon to everyone out there on Irish Breakdown land. I'm Vince D'Addario. I'm the football analyst here at irishbreakdown.com. With me, as always, is that guy right there. That's <laughs> Brian Driscoll. He's the publisher at irishbreakdown.com. And uh, we're going to talk a little offensive line today, specifically Harry Heastand returning to the offensive line and why, obviously, it's huge that he's coming back. I mean, his reputation clearly speaks for itself, his track record, et cetera, but I think the timing of this whole thing really just couldn't work out better with him coming in. You've got eight guys with at least two starts under their belt. And then you've got a depth chart with a lot of young talent. A lot of guys are going to be freshmen, sophomores, and they got a lot of football ahead of them. So it just feels like it's a good place, a good timing. Yeah, I mean, and that's kind of the premise of the show today is it's obviously important that there's an upgrade on offensive line. I mean, that's something we've been talking about for years at Irish Breakdown. And with all due respect to Coach Quinn, he did the best he could. He tried sure. hard. I've never questioned his character, his work ethic. I just never. questioned his results right? and ability to really lead a, an elite offensive line. There are so many different reasons why I think the timing of this couldn't be better. And, you know, we, we've seen – we're entering a phase – this more big picture first, Vince. Yeah, We're entering a phase where – Notre Dame was fortunate, let's be honest. The last four or five, four years, 2017, challenging schedule. 18 to 21, not really so much, especially, especially the last two years. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, you had Clemson, and outside of Clemson last year and Cincinnati this year, I mean, you know, what what's Notre Dame hanging its schedule on? Right. An eight and four North Carolina team. Well, and going into right. last year, it was like, okay, there, you know, we talked about tough stretches and, you know, some different areas where the schedule could have been really difficult. It just, just didn't turn out that way. Well, I mean, and then when they lost the original schedule that was supposed to have Arkansas, it was supposed oh, to have Wisconsin, sure. it was supposed to have Clemson. In, yeah. You know, and 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 you replace the, some of those teams with what they replaced them with. And, you know, I mean, you had, you had Clemson that was really good, but you beat them in overtime without Trevor Lawrence, without Tyler Davis, without James Skalski, without Mike Jones. Right. Then you play an 8-4 North Carolina team. Your next two big wins are over, what, 6-5 and five North Carolina and Pitt. Yeah. And after that, everybody had a losing record. You know, this year, same th- kind of thing. You know, we're, we're talking about how we felt Notre Dame was one of the four best teams in the country from a talent standpoint. But the, the the problem that we had as far as pushing for them to be in the playoff was, what's the resume built around? Sure, a win over a seven and five Wisconsin team, or an eight and four Wisconsin team, or or an eight and four Purdue team. I mean, that's what you're. And Notre Dame literally didn't beat a ranked team this year, as far right. as and we were was ranked at the end of the year. And remember, going into the final rankings, we're like, man, if if this 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 and happens, then, right. then Purdue might get ranked. Like th- those are the conversations right. that we were having to build your resume, right, around, right. right? And so you 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 you're now looking fast forward a little bit, and let's look at the two thousand the two thousand twenty two and the two thousand. 23 schedules that's and animal. you know and 24 so i mean 22 23 24 things gonna amp up a little bit for notre dame now number one the biggest thing is usc just hired lane you know rank lincoln riley now i think lincoln riley has a lot to prove you know lincoln riley inherited a playoff team at oklahoma I mean, Bob Stoops left him with a team that had already been to the college yeah. football oh, playoff when he left, right? He walked into a great situation. Right. Not and, a rebuild at a all. Job, you know, continuing it and all those type of things. But it wasn't like he walked into a situation where, you know, they they were they were this not good football team, right? He walked right. into a pretty good situation there. And and he's back. That helps their situation, obviously. You look at other things that factor into it. You know, this year you play at Ohio State, you play Clemson, you play a BYU team on a neutral field that you know that's been pretty good the last this past two seasons. Sure. You know, Boston College should be better this upcoming season. So the schedule like at North Carolina, so the schedule ramps up a little bit, right? And then you look at 2023, and it doesn't get easier. You know, you play Ohio State and USC, or you know, by October 14th, you played both of those at home. You have another road game against Clemson. You have NC State and Louisville coming up as road games in a couple of years. You're going to have Pitt at home. You know, who knows what Stanford's going to do. And then you look at the 2024 schedule, and I think that's when Texas A&M jumps on. Yeah, at Texas A&M, yeah. at Purdue. Uh, you've got Florida State on the schedule. At USC, you got Miami that just hired Mario Cristobal 
is going to be back on the schedule in 2014, a home game for Notre Dame. So when you look at the schedule, I think that I mentioned Florida State is going to be on that schedule as well. So when you look at the schedule, it what we think is that it's going to tick up a little bit. Sure, absolutely. Quite a bit, actually, I think, unless yeah. some teams kind of fall back down. And, you know, I don't think Clemson's descent is permanent. I think they're going to ascend back up. I don't think they're ever going to be what they were from 16 to 18. I think that was a stretch that was unique. Yeah. Uh, because but I think they'll of, be solid. I mean, I don't, gonna, well, I'd say yeah. they're going to be better than solid. They're going to be the well, best yeah. team in the ACC. They're going to be a perennial yeah. top 10 team. They're just not right. going to be right. that team every single year that Bama worries about. Right. I don't think they're going to be quite that again, but they're still going to be really good. You know, Texas A&M just signed the number one recruiting class in the country. By the time Notre Dame has to go out there, those guys will be juniors, right? And so the schedule upticks, and you can't get away with just out-talenting 10, 11 opponents a year like Notre Dame has done the last several years. You're going to have to outplay and outcoach people. It's going to look a lot more like the 2017 season when Notre Dame played seven ranked teams, right. and they went four and three against those ranked teams. You know, they, they lost some games they shouldn't have, won some impressive sure. games. Sure. But <coughs> sorry, still coming back from this. They lost some games that year that, you know, they probably should have won. But when you play more good teams week after week after week, like Notre Dame did in 2017, then you're you're going to have a situation where um, you have to bring it more. You can't you can't play like, for example, if Notre Dame's line would have played the first half of the 2017 season, like it played the first half of the 2021 season, they lose to Georgia. They lose to Michigan state for sure. Right. You know, they don't beat USC like they did. Cause that game was a hundred percent fueled by a dominant offensive line performance. No question. You know, and you look at the NC state <laughs> game, that would have been a lot more of a challenging game. You know, Boston College was a close game in the first half until the offensive line took that game over. There's a lot of games you look at and say, I don't know if Notre Dame wins that game if you have line play like you had in 2021. You were able to get away with that last year and in 2020 because, well, 2020 the line played better, but you were able to get away with it last year because your the schedule stunk, especially the second half. I mean, well, I think was... getting Harry Heastan back at a time when the schedule is toughening up is important. Number two. I think that you're you're entering a phase in Tommy Reese's career that he's going to start either showing us that we're correct in thinking he's got a chance to be a really really good offensive coordinator. You're 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 putting like one of the concerns I have is that coach Reese seems to be a guy that that thinks he has all the answers. And he's only going to listen to a select number of people, which sure. is not a criticism to be completely honest with you because I've been there as you know, and, and when you think you're smarter than everybody else in the room, and sometimes you are, you're only going to listen to a certain number of people. Right. And I don't think that this is just my opinion. This isn't me sharing Intel, but just things that I've heard and just, you know, just trying to read the room a little bit. I don't think he, I think he liked Jeff Quinn as a, as a man. Everyone did. Everyone did. But I don't think he was someone that he was going to every day saying, Hey, what should we do here? Right. I think Coach Reese understood that, you know, I'm kind of playing with my hand tied behind my back a little bit here. Sure, yeah, right. I think it's important that he gets someone better, but I think Harry Heastan is someone that Tommy Reese respects. From what I'm told, this is the move, this is the direction that Tommy wanted to go with because he played under and coached under Harry Heastan. And I think that Harry Heastan's the kind of person that when he has an idea, you're going to listen. And if you don't want to listen, <laughs> it's going to make you listen. Right, exactly. You know, and, Or he's not going to be there much longer. I mean, right. he, he just demands that kind of respect and that he deserves it. I mean, his track right. record shows that he deserves it, right? Right. Yeah. And so I think that's important too. So here, so, so Tommy's entering that, you know, this is now going to be his third year as, an, as a coordinator. He's kind of hitting that st stretch where if he's as good as we think he is, he should really take off. But I don't care how good of an offensive coordinator you are. If you don't have really good O-line play, you're going to be limited. So now that he enters that phase, bring in Harry Heastan, and all of a sudden, okay, now you can't use, well, the line the line wasn't what we hoped it would be. The line didn't do its job kind of right. thing. That's not right. going to be an excuse anymore. And I think that's good for Coach Reese. So that's another kind of big picture reason. I think number three, I think the defense is getting to the point where 
we saw this year and it, it, the issue I feel, and just talking to some people that some of the issues that the team had on defense weren't exposed until they got to games. And because they just the offense couldn't hurt them with it or or didn't have the ability to do certain things to get to, to create problems. And it wasn't until Saturdays that that happened. When in 2017, 2015, I guarantee you, the defense knew exactly what its issues were because they were exposed by that offense. I uh, CJ Prosize was on the Lucky Lefty podcast yesterday with uh, right. with Malik and Sean, and he talked about that. He was like, you know, in 2015, you know, we we like had a we were a really explosive offense, so sometimes we wondered like, are we supposed to be making this many big plays in practice? <laughs> You know what I mean? So the problems that that defense was going to have in games manifested in practice. I think that having an offensive line that's coached by Harry Heastan is going to do wonders for Al Washington's defensive line and, Mar- and and whoever Marcus Freeman hires as the defensive coordinator moving forward. Mike Elko talked about this a lot. Their truth – what did he call them? Truth detect- – lie detectors? Yeah, right. Isn't that what he called the offensive line? He called yep. them lie detectors? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, they're going to expose the truth. Exactly. Right? And they're going to make you better. And I think as you enter this stretch of big games and tough schedules, you need to have all of that as part of what you're doing. And so that's the first set of reasons, Vince. And then, of course, the second part is just the players that they're going to have coming back. Absolutely. No, absolutely. And I, I think – I think the defensive one is very interesting because the the bar has been set very high on the defensive line as far as recruiting and and I'm going I'm you know up to this point with Mike Elson with coaching and and I I have full faith that that Al Washington will continue that trend right and you know it, it's like those old Lou Holtz days where practices were harder than the games well yeah. that's what I want to see in the trenches right you know what I mean I want to see those guys beating each other and right. and making each other better every day in practice so that when they get up in the game, it's like <laughs> we compete against guys that are better than this in practice every day. You know what I mean? Like that makes your team better and mm-hmm. that raises the standard big time. And, and I think you're going to see some epic battles at practice between Al Washington's crew and Harry Heastan's crew. I, and I, and I that makes you fun. better as a team. Yeah. And that's the important. No question. No question. I think the timing of it from a player personnel standpoint is also very, very important. And what I mean by that is, you know, we, we brought this up the other day. It was something that we talked about during the offseason, which was this was a big year for Jeff Quinn in that he was going to be coaching sort of his players for the first time. Right. And what I meant by that was in 2018, Jarrett Patterson, or no, Jarrett Patterson was in the center in 2018. In 2018, the entire starting lineup was was Harry Heastan's recruits and guys he coached. Right. 2019, it was four of them, and then Jarrett Patterson. Yep. 2020, it was four of them and Jarrett Patterson. So Jarrett Patterson was kind of lifted up by being surrounded by Harry Heastan guys. He was learning lessons from guys that learned their lessons from right. Harry Heastan. Right, right, right. Well, this was the first year that we were going to see a bunch of Jeff Quinn guys. And Josh Lug was the only guy that had been coached or recruited by Harry Heastan or been coached by Harry Heastan or recruited like as the full, the full right. deal. Right. And we saw a line that just didn't know how to play physical, didn't know how to play with good technique, all those different things. And it was obviously a problem. And so now you look at it and say, okay, well, moving forward, how deep do you want to go into that? How deep do you want to go into Jeff Quinn being the only voice that those guys hear? And the only foundation that, that, that you know, that, that you're building on that, on his foundation for multiple years with him. I think when I look at the freshman, for example, Joe Walt being so successful. Well, Joe Walt was not an early enrollee. He was that rare freshman lineman that played as a freshman without having the whole offseason on campus. And so, you know, he came in as a really fundamentally sound player because of his dad and, and all those type of things, who was an NFL lineman and played offensive line at Iowa all, for a long time. Right. And and he remade his body in the offseason. Right. Too. Right. But my point is more so, does he lose some of that technical savviness the longer he stays in the Jeff Quinn era? You know, how long does till, till you know does Blake Fisher kind of develop in that system? All those things matter because you know the first couple classes for Jeff Quinn were a little hit or miss numbers wise, and then you know, 2020. One starts to kind of fix that with the high level players at the top with Blake and Rocco. Then you get a, a project that you and I liked. We thought it was a project 
in Joe Alt, but a guy that I gave a four and a half star upside grade to, which is a top 50 national player. You know, and then, you know, solid player like Caleb Johnson. And then, of course, 2022, you know, you get a really good four man class before Quinn leaves. And then Tommy Reese is able to go out and get Billy Shrouth to kind of finish that class off, even though it was known by then that Jeff Quinn wasn't coming back. You've kind of salvaged the roster a little bit with recruiting. And Jeff and Jeff Quinn deserves some credit for that, sure. that he was able to bring in those guys. But it's like, okay, but who's going to teach those guys how to play? And the longer this carries on, the the harder the the the, the reclamation project was going to be for Harry Heastan. So sure. you know you look at it now and you can say arguably your four or five just most God given talented players are going to be guys that spent no more than a semester or two semesters under Jeff Quinn or didn't weren't coached by Jeff Quinn at all. When you look at you know the incoming freshman class, Billy Shroud, Joey Tonona, Emil Wagner, Ty Chan, and Ashton Craig, and I think that that matters. Yeah. You know, you go another year of this. And all of a sudden, it's like just more of those bad habits or not even bad habits, but just not being taught the important, the really important things becomes more and more prominent. And, and I think that's another reason why I think the timing of this is so important for Harry Heastan's return. Like if you do this a year from now, you know, I don't know if that impact is the same where now you're going to go into the 2023 season with – Clemson on the road and Ohio State at home and year two of Lincoln Riley and all those type of things with a much what you're now going to be in year two of Harry Heastan. Right. And and you know, then you go into 2024 with Texas AM and Miami, and you're going to be in year three of Harry Heastan. And so I think those things are important. And I think those things, and I think that Notre Dame has skill talent, the potential skill talent the next couple of years to be as good as they've had in the last decade. I believe that like top to bottom and the thing holding them back, we felt in a lot of instances was the offensive playing the offensive line. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm doing some research now and I'm studying the number of 20 plus yard runs between 15 to 17 and then 18 to 21. I want to see, cause I just felt like they just didn't have as many holes for the backs to get through. And you, and even some of the big runs we saw this year were plays where they had to make dudes miss behind the line of scrimmage. You know, like the 90 something yard run, like here's like Kyron Williams. What was it? A 93 yard touchdown run was a 91 yard touchdown. I think it was 91, 91 with the big stiff arm. Same, and yeah. same length as CJ Procise against Georgia tech in 2015, two completely different runs. Oh yeah. On one, the guy has to make somebody, two people miss in the backfield has to cut back against the grain has to stiff arm a guy several yards behind the line of scrimmage, and then he goes. That's not an offensive line thing. CJ's in 2015 against Georgia Tech is a counter play where nobody touches him. You think of the 80-yard run that Josh Adams had against USC. Nobody touches him. Like, when was the and last time downhill, Chris Ty- just Right. Boom. When was the last time Chris Tyree had a hole to run through where nobody touched him? It was in 2020 against Syracuse, and he went for 80-plus yards. Right, he didn't have those holes. Kyron didn't have those holes. That's why it was so right. important to have Kyron because he can Kyron make could stuff make happen. things yeah, happen. Exactly. You know, that's why he was so valuable. That's not Chris's year. game. Chris's right. game is one cut and go, hit that right. hole. You know, he is a he is an explosive guy. In order to maximize Chris Tyree's skill set, you need a guy. You need a line that can do what Harry Heastan's lines did in fifteen, sure, and even in sixteen and seventeen. I mean, I, even the the sixteen game where they were completely outmanned against USC. The reason they stayed in that game in the first half is because they were running on USC. I mean, first play of the game, Josh Adams goes for seventy five yards. You know, and and so those are the things you look at and say, if they could take the line play from fifteen and seventeen and put it with the skill talent that they've recruited the last, you know, three, four years, boy, that could be impressive. Well, now we get a chance to actually see that. And I think that to me is what makes it important. And then of course, it's going to be up to coach Heastan to continue to recruit and add on to that. But you think about Harry Heastan's guaranteed at least two years with Blake Fisher and Joe Walton. Yeah. Has to. He gets Jarrett Patterson for a year, right? You know, he's going to get a chance to, you know, some of the kids, like some of the kids on the roster are guys he recruited but never coached. You know, he he clearly saw something in Zeke Carell and sure. Andrew Christophic 
because he recruited them. He offered them before he left, if you remember correctly. Sure, yeah. So clearly he saw something in those guys he liked. Now you feel like, okay, if Zeke Carell is a guy that we think can play, well, now we're going to find out if he is or isn't. We're going to find that out about Andrew Christophic. And so that, to me, is the exciting. And Josh Lug, too, is another one. Like, Josh has to stay healthy, but I feel like Josh never had a coach. In the, like, it's not a coincidence that the further along Josh got in his career, the worse he got. Yeah, he really did. Technically and yeah. fundamentally and all yeah. those type of ways. Well, I have a theory on that, and that's going to be proven true or false to a degree this season. And my theory is the further he got away from Harry's teaching, the worse he got. Because Josh need Josh is – and one thing we've said about him, Josh is one of those kids that needs a little bit of a kick in the butt. Mm-hmm. And I think Josh knows he needs a kick in the butt. That's just the kind of kid he is, right? And that's not a negative. It's just some guys need to be pushed. Sure, sure. And Josh needs to be pushed. Yeah. And he, but he wasn't getting that push the way it was needed. And I'm not talking about push like yelling at him. I'm talking about pushing as far as how you're coaching him and making sure that you're really staying on him and giving him the tools to. I mean, he wasn't that ready-made offensive lineman like, like Robert Hainsey was, and to a degree, like Liam Eikenberg was. He was kind of a raw kid that came from a system where they threw the ball like two, three times a game. Right. And he needed that work and needed that coaching. Well, now he's going to get that for a year. So do we see the Josh Lug we thought we were going to get when he was coming out of high school or in 2019 when he's a pretty good player, when he replaced Robert Hainsey and played pretty darn good football down the stretch? Are we going to see that guy or are we going to see the guy that struggled the last two years for the most part? I think for me and Josh, I, I love Josh Lug. And I, I've made that very clear as a kid and, and as a player and all that. And I, I've been high on Josh for the last few years. Um, what worries me about this year, and I, I don't want to dive too deep into this, but it's, it's just from the injuries, right? And and staying healthy and all of that. I, I think Harry can be instrumental in getting him back to where he needs to be from a fundamental standpoint. I do. I, I absolutely believe that. I'm just worried he's had so many injuries up to this point. It, has it been too many? You know, you know what I mean? Has it has it gotten to the point where his injury history is going to prevent him from being the guy that we hope he can be? Well, I think it might prevent him from being the guy he was coming out of high school. I okay. don't think it's going to prevent him from being a pretty good football player because the issues that he had this year, Vince, for the most part, were technical. We talked sure. all oh, yeah. about oh, that yeah. horrible pass set that he had, which he just lost all his power, all his base, and guys were able to get up under his chest, and it happened every single time he got beat. You know, yep. and, and so His power rushes. Yeah. Minutes. And yeah. It, it wasn't a lack of talent. It wasn't like a oh, he's trying hard. It wasn't like what happened with Tommy Kramer last year, where Tommy was giving you everything he had, but he just was playing through so many injuries. Well, you know, Tommy Kramer's healthy now and he's starting in the NFL. Undrafted free agent starting in the NFL. True. You know, and and you, you look at that and say, look, that's the kind of thing for me with Josh Lug is maybe Josh isn't going to be an elite player. But I, I think that he's got a chance to be a, a better, more consistent player than what we had, than what we saw the last couple years from him. That's what I think. Because there were sure. times, there were stretches this year where Josh Lug played good football. Right. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, that's kind of where it is. So, you know, when you look at it, I think, and then, you know, somebody somebody just said, uh, asked a question, Bobby S., is Chris Watt coming back and in what role? We talked about this the other day, too, is he is coming back. He is going to be uh, probably an analyst at this point in time, which means he's going to, he's not going to be, he's going to be on the field, but he can't coach on the field. Right. He can coach in the film room and those kind of things, and I think that's going to be an important thing. And I think that's another piece of this is, I don't know if the GA from last year is going to be back, but I heard some good things about him as a a young up and coming coach, if he is still back, you're going to have him. He's going to learn a ton from Harry. And if he's smart, he's going to want to stay and learn from Harry. Eastan. And if he's back and he was out on the road recently, visiting recruits. So I imagine he's planning on coming back. If what I heard about him is true, that's going to be a really good resource for Harry. Easton. And he has Chris Watt as an analyst. It's not just Harry. It's, I think it's Trevor Mendelson, I think is his name. Is that Yeah, is that, that sounds name? familiar. Yeah, that uh, sounds is right. Is the GA. I've heard some really good things yeah. about him as a young coach. Love, I saw him. talked about I mean, Chris Watt. Look, he coached. He was coaching. They were doing some half-line stuff uh, at the one practice we were allowed to see 
uh, prior to the Fiesta Bowl, right? Mm -hmm. And while my focus was a lot on Marcus Freeman, I did watch him a little bit because they were on opposite sides of the field, right? They were on like hash and hash, essentially, and he was coaching mm -hmm. one half, and Quinn was coaching the other half. And he's a very vocal guy. Like, he was coaching him up. Right. And I – excuse me, I was actually pretty impressed by him. Yeah, and so now you let him learn under someone like Harry Heastan, and he's going to get better. But that's a great resource for Harry Heastan because I'll say this – and you saw this in practice events. Harry Heastan always did a really good job of, of of giving his GAs a role. Yes. And utilizing them to help coach the entire line. That was something that was very important to Coach Heastan was, I can't just coach the starters. Right. I got to coach everybody. <clears throat> that's so Because when the starters leave, somebody's going to have to step into that role, exactly. right? Exactly. And, and so that's, to me, a very important piece to this. And so I, just another thing to look into this and talk about, like, why – why is this so important? Why is the timing of it so important? Um, what what kind of impact could this have? And, and the way I look sure, at it is sure. this. Notre Dame went out in the Fiesta Bowl and scored 35 points, had 600 yards of offense against uh, – passed for over 500 yards against one of the best defenses in college football and did it with zero run game. Zero run game. Right. What happens when the run game starts getting there and you can at least be, you know, we're battling in the run game, right? You're at least battling in the run game. When that happens, you know, I start wondering about, man, this offense could take off. And that's kind of what we get to when we talk about the Tom, Tommy Reese effect is the timing of Harry Heastan returning is big for, for Tommy as well. And, and so those are just the things and it's, it's needed because this, this schedule does not, continue the way it has exactly the softness of the schedule you know, does not continue i mean you said it's gonna it's gonna tick up i mean i think that's a yeah. nice way of putting it think I, about I, this yeah. think about this in the last three years notre dame has gone 11 and 2 10 and 2 and 11 and 2 and they've beaten a grand total of three ranked opponents at the end of the year yeah not top 10 navy ranked in 2019 clemson last year North Carolina last year, an eight and four North Carolina team. Uh, th those are, those are to me that like 2018, they beat three in the regular season. In 2017, they beat four ranked teams. And that's what I said. Brandon Wimbush won as many games against top 25 opponents in 15 starts as Ian Book won in whatever. And I'm not blaming Ian Book for that. You can't beat ranked teams if you don't play them. Yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah, you, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And and you know, obviously they lost. They I think they went five and five against ranked opponents. Um, you know, um, that's not going to be the case moving forward. Exactly. You're going to play more ranked teams. Yep. Yep. And Rubber's one of the things the about yeah. yeah, and one of the things about Notre Dame's schedule going down, it had tied a lot into Stanford and USC. Both went down at the same time. Because those used to be two quality teams to have on your yeah. schedule. I mean, 16 and 17, yeah. they were arguably, you know, your your best and second best opponent in those two years. They right. were the best opponent you faced in 2016. They were the second best opponent you faced in 2017 behind Georgia. Right, right. Well, in the last, you know, since then, they've been, you know, a hot mess. Well, that's that's not going to be the case anymore. So, uh, it's it's going to be interesting. And, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to, We've got a couple super chats here. We're, we're going to try to get a guest on here soon, and I uh, hope to be able to continue this Harry Heastan conversation with him. Garrett Nutson says, in the past, has Harry Heastan been that type of guy that takes younger coaches under his wing, or is he the type to focus on his sex responsibility, just wondering who Tommy Reese's mentors are? I can only speak to this for a year. I, 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 he didn't really have any young coaches. What I know is this. Chip Long is a, is a lot like Tommy Reese. Chip Long thinks he's the smartest guy in the room all the time. And I think a lot of times, because you know, he is smart, he has had success. I'm not saying that as an insult. I mean, I guarantee you that's a criticism people have made of me in the past. He always thinks he's the smartest guy in the room. Uh, Chip Long loved Harry and listened to Harry a lot. Because Harry is an incredibly well-respected coach. I mean, I, I've said this about the videos I was watching this past offseason of all these offensive line coaches, NFL coaches, you know, D1 Power 5 coaches, and Harry Heastan's name just randomly gets brought up like five or six times. 
Jeff Quinn spoke at this thing. Nobody brought up Jeff Quinn. Everybody talked about Harry Heastan. And there's a reason for that. He's a very well-respected offensive line coach. He's also not someone that just walks in the room and starts telling you all these different things. He's going to work within the framework of the offense. So I do think that this is a great question. Uh, I do think he's never worked with a 29-year-old offensive coordinator, but Chip Long was like 34. So right, it's not he like wasn't it's an huge, old man. Yeah, and it was right. Chip's first year or second year as a coordinator. It was it. So he was also a young play caller. And Harry Heastan did take him under his wing, and Chip allowed himself to be taken. I don't know if Tommy Reese will be allow, will allow Harry to take him under his wing. I don't think that's necessarily what Tommy Reese needs. What I think Tommy Reese needs isn't a, a mentor. I think Tommy Reese needs an offensive line coach that he trusts yes, and listens to. Absolutely. And I think that's more important because Tommy Reese's mentor his whole life has been his dad. I mean, his dad was a coach. His dad coached sure. was a recruiter under Terry Donahue. He grew up in a football right. home. He and he's an analyst on the staff. So, I mean, he's right, right there. Yeah. What he needs is not a mentor as much as he needs someone that he trusts right. that will do what he asks him to do, that will challenge Tommy about certain things that Tommy will listen to when challenged. Exactly. Yep. That's what he needs more than a mentor. Um, I, but the spirit of your question, I really like, and I, and, and I, I think it was, it's a, you know, I, I think it's one that, that makes a lot of sense. John a one says, what can Tosh Baker do to impress Harry? He does Harry, he have the toughest task of the position coaches. I don't think he has the toughest task. I, I, I think that, I think that, uh, I would argue that, that Mike Mickens and Chancey Stuckey have the toughest tasks simply because of inexperience for Mike Mickens finding some guys that can play sure. for Chancey yeah. Stucky. It's just starting from scratch. I mean, it's you know, a blank and, slate, and man. You, you're, you're going to be missing half your depth yeah. chart in the spring. Right. Yeah. That's, you know, thing. I mean, you're yeah. not going to have Avery Davis. You're not going to have Joe Wilkins. You're, you, you know, it's, it's, I think those are, I don't think Harry Heastan has a tough task. He has an important one. Right. Exactly. And he has a talented offensive line. I'll, I'll say this, the talent he's inheriting top to bottom is better now than when he walked in the door in 2012. I mean, I love Zach Martin, but if we're just going to look at what they were as redshirt freshmen and freshmen, I would argue that that, you know, the, the talent that he's inheriting now top to bottom is better than it was in 2012. And this yeah. is no do, disrespect to Braxton Cave or Mike Golick Jr. or Christian Lombard, but I mean, there's there's guys that are going to be backups on this offensive line that would start on half of Harry Heastan's early offensive lines, you know, that are just going to have a hard time seeing the field now. So I don't think his task is tough. I think his task is very important. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the key. That's the key.